Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good to see you here this morning. Yeah. And today we will be continuing our series, Heaven on Earth, uh, looking at the book of Ephesians especially, but considering in, in the world, the culture, society we live in today, how do we uh, live wisely, godly, appropriately uh, in this world? Uh, today we want to the, the lesson. Last week, our, our pastor uh, gave us just introductory material about uh, Ephesians and the, and the, uh, the city of Ephesus and the, the culture there and background. And also, we looked at the first couple verses of chapter one. And today we're going to be looking at uh, a rather lengthy passage, chapter one, verses three to fourteen. And let me just comment: this is a amazing portion of scripture. This is, I think, one of the most powerful statements in all of Scripture. And, and I say that because in the original Greek that the New Testament was written in, verses 3 to 14 is one sentence. <laughs> uh, Paul would not have done well in English comp. He would not have passed <laughs> with good grades because this is definitely a run-on sentence. It's, in Greek, it's 201 words. Making up one sentence. So it's all one thought. But it's all about who we are in Christ. What Christ has done for us. And it's a beautiful portion of, of scripture. In fact, I, I thought before we actually get into to picking it apart a little bit and looking at the scripture. Uh, what I want you to do is just for a, a moment close your eyes. And uh, listen as I read this portion of scripture in, in a contemporary or modern Translation And just think about the words, let the, the beauty and the power of this portion of scripture speak to you. Blessed be the God and Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, who has conferred on us in Christ every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms. Before the foundation of the world, he chose us in Christ to be his people, to be without blemish in his sight to be full of love. And he predestined us to be adopted as his children through Jesus Christ. This was his will and pleasure in order that the glory of his gracious gift so graciously conferred on us in his beloved one might be down to his praise. In Christ, our release is secured and our sins are forgiven through the shedding of his blood in the richness of his grace God has lavished on us all wisdom and insight he has made known to us his secret purpose and in course the plan which he determined beforehand in Christ to be put into effect when the time was right namely that the universe everything in heaven and on earth might be brought into a unity in Christ in Christ, indeed, we have been given our share in the heritage, as was decreed in his design, whose purpose is everywhere at work. For it is his will that we, who were the first to set our hope in Christ, should cause his glory to be praised. And in Christ you also, once you had heard the message of the truth and the good news of your salvation, and had believed it, in him, you were stamped with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. And that spirit is a pledge of the inheritance which will be ours when God has redeemed what is his own to his glory and his praise. Isn't that a beautiful portion of scripture? Yeah. I mean, it is just so full of, of, of thoughts and ideas and concepts and so today we want to be looking at those a little bit. We'll be talking about being stamped, finding your identity in Christ. Now, we live in a culture where identity is, is all important, you know, and so many things defines us. In fact, you know, we live in this culture where people want to self-identify. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I saw a video, if you're familiar with the Babylon Bee, I love them. It's this conservative Christian group that 
Uh, they, they put out these articles, and, and, and it's, all, it's, it's, it's all satirical. It's all sort of poking fun at things in our culture. And one of them is about th this whole uh, issue of being vaccinated or not vaccinated. This one guy starts to go, tries to go into a restaurant, tries to go into this one place, and, and when they find out he's not vaccinated, they spit at him, they smack him, and everything else. And so then this guy appears on the scene and gives him this t-shirt that solves all his problems. It says, I self-identify as vaccinated. <laughs> and once he self-identifies as vaccinated, it's like, yes, sir, come in, sit down. Yes, we honor you. Yes, because whatever you self-identify as, well, that's who you are in our popular culture. I mean, identity is so critically important. And what the culture says to us is this is how you identify yourself. This is where you find your identity. It's in your gender or your sexual orientation or your ethnicity or your skin color or the language you speak or your culture or your political views or what country you're from or what part of this country you're from or whatever. We have all these external things that say this is who we are. But can I tell you, that's not where we really find our identity. Our identity is not found in the language we speak or the color of our skin or how we self-identify as anything. Our identity is found in Christ. Those two words are key. They're the clue. They're the answer to knowing who we really are. Listen to what Paul said to the Colossians and Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. So this then you've been raised with Christ. Set your heart on things above. In other words, when you think about everything, including who you are, should be focused on heaven. Where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ. In God. I love that phrase. Your life is hidden with Christ in God. Your life is in Christ. And since Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father, that's where your life is. That's where your true identity is. You are, more than anything else, a kingdom citizen, not a citizen of this world. You are part of the body of Christ, not part of this earthly Existence. That's where your identity is. Looking at our text, Ephesians 1, verse 3, Paul starts off this incredible, powerful sentence by saying, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. This is your memory verse, by the way, for this week. In Christ, you have been blessed with every spiritual blessing blessing in the heavenly realms. This is this heaven on earth theme that we're dealing with through this entire series. Your life really is not all about here. It's so easy to get bogged down in the here and the now, but your life is really hidden with Christ in God. And that phrase, in Christ, is so important. It is the key to what we're talking about today. What is our identity? Who are we? We are who we are in Christ. In fact, th those two words, that little phrase, in Christ, is used by Paul 164 times in his writings. It's used 36 times just in the six chapters of, uh, of Ephesians. Who are you in Christ? Who are you? Identify yourself in Christ. And if we could learn this, it would solve so many of the struggles and problems we face in our lives. Who are we in Christ? Let me tell you. This is where the message is going to be. This is what I want you to get. You are not the mistakes you've made in life. You're not your failures. You're not your weaknesses. You're not the labels that other people have put on you. You're not even what you think about yourself. You are who God says you are. Nothing less, nothing else. You are blessed with every spiritual blessing in Christ. You are chosen in him from before the beginning of time. You are blameless in the eyes of God. You are adopted by the Heavenly Father. I lost a page. Okay. All right. 
Excuse me for one moment. Okay. Well, I have a total page missing. So, uh, pray for my memory right now. Looking again in uh, Ephesians 1 3, where it says to us, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing. Uh, what I want you to see is, as we go through this passage, that it's like pieces of a puzzle. There's seven pieces that we want to look at. And we're going to put together each of these seven pieces, and you'll get the complete picture of your identity, of who you are in Christ. And the first one is found in that verse, chapter 1, verse 3. You are blessed with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Peace puzzle, puzzle piece number one, you are blessed. You are blessed. You are blessed. God favors you. He looks on you with acceptance, with kindness, with love, and blessing. And he not only has blessed you, but he has blessed you with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Now, that is, if you stop and think about that, that boggles the mind. Every spiritual blessing that you could want, you could desire, or that you could need, or feel a, a lack of in your life, and want to see in your life, everything... You have already been blessed in Christ with that. So often we struggle with things in our Christian life because we feel like we're not equipped enough. We don't have enough knowledge. We don't have skill. We don't have a talent or ability. We don't have strength. We don't have what we need to do what God wants us to do. But the reality is we've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Listen to what Peter said about this in 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 3. His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. In Christ you already have been given everything you need to live a godly life. I've talked with many people through the years who struggle in the Christian lives. Some have given up on the faith. And, and so often people say, I just can't do it. I can't live the Christian life. Well, no, in your own power and ability, you can't. But understand in Christ, you have been given everything you need. You have been fully equipped to live godly. And these blessings are found in the heavenlies. Or you are identified with Christ. In Christ, you have been blessed with all spiritual blessings. Now look in Ephesians 1.4, so we can find the second puzzle piece. For he chose us in him, in Christ, before the creation of the world, to be holy and blameless in his sight. Before God did anything else, he looked out through time and eternity, and he saw each one of us, and he chose us as his own. And he blessed us. And in this verse, we see revealed two more puzzle pieces. One is, you were chosen. You were chosen. You were handpicked by God. He has selected you to be his very own. He has chosen you to be his child. He has predestined you, is a fancy word for it. He has planned to cleanse you of all sin and prepare you to be Part of the bride of Christ. And you know, it's funny to me when you get to the doctrine of predestination, God choosing us in Christ before the foundation of the world. A lot of people stumble here, they get all upset, they get all whacked out in their brains, they try to figure it out. Can I tell you, every place in the New Testament that talks about predestination, it's a passage offering comfort and assurance. Paul is not trying to create doctrinal or theological controversy here. This is not a verse to argue over. It's a verse to be assured through. It's a verse to give us confidence and hope and assurance in our Christian lives. Understand, you are chosen. Let that sink in a moment. God picked you to be his own. Can you really grab hold of that? 
you, I don't know how you feel about yourself today. You might feel like you've had a lousy week. Your day might have started out lousy. Mine didn't start out so good. I messed up already this morning. But you know what? He picked me. He looked down from before the world ever began. And he said, I handpicked Pat Lawson Morris to be my child. I choose Michelle Knapper to be my daughter. I pick Michael Moore to be a son of the living God. You are mine. I pick you. Oh, that should get such joy to your heart. That should strengthen you inside. That should buoy up your spirits and say, I am chosen of God. I am handpicked by God. I am his. I am his. I belong to him because he chose me. Wow. And he not only chose you, but continue that verse. He, he chose us from before the creation of the world, not only to be his, but to be holy and blameless in his sight. Now, I, again, I don't know about you, but this really helps me. Because I look at my own life and I struggle so much sometimes. Because I know how often I still flub up and mess things up. How many mistakes I make. Every day I try to... In my day, I, I, I'm, I'm trying to make it a practice right now to pray the Lord's Prayer every day. And when I get to the part, forgive us our debts, I'll stop and say, oh God, I got it a lot. <laughs> I've messed up. But he says he chose us not only just to be his, but to be holy and blameless. He says, you need to understand when I chose you, I made all the preparation and planning and equipping needed to see that you would live holy. I remember many years ago, I was preaching at a church in Roanoke, and I was preparing the message for that sermon that Sunday morning, and I was studying the passage in John where Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commands. Now, he says that three times in John. And two of those is basically just a statement. And I've always looked at that verse saying, okay, God, I, I, I know I don't love you like I should. Because I'm not perfect in keeping your commands. Too often I don't. Too often I disobey. But the third time Jesus says that, it's not in, 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 in indicative, just making a statement. It's in the future tense. And what he is saying is, if you love me, if you choose me and put me first and decide you're going to love me and devote to me, if you do that, you will. It's going to happen. This is a promise. Sometime in the future. It might not happen tomorrow. It might not happen the next day. It might not happen you get the glory. But there's going to come a time when you obey me fully and completely. You will obey my commands. I promise you that. I declare it to you. And what this verse says is, God chose that for us from before the creation of the world. Amen. So if you're struggling with things in your life, take hold of this promise. I was chosen to be holy. I was chosen to be blameless. That should give such assurance and confidence in our lives as we are. That's who you are in Christ. You see, we need to understand that, that he has made the provision so that can happen. 2 Corinthians 5, 21 says, God made him, Christ, to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be the, become the righteousness of God. God provided for us in making plans and choosing us to be holy and blameless in his sight. He made provision. You are not holy because of who you are. You are not holy and blameless in his sight because of any goodness or anything you can do. You are holy and blameless in his sight because of what Christ already did for you. You have, are now the righteousness of God in Christ. And when the Father looks on you, and our pastor has mentioned this several times in the past couple of weeks, when the Father looks on you, what does he see? Well, I think he sees my bumbling, stumbling, failing ways. But that's not what he sees. He sees Christ. He sees the blood. He sees the holiness of Jesus. He sees the righteousness of Christ. And he looks at you and he says, you're holy. 
No, not me, God. Yes. You're holy. You are holy and blameless in your sight. A pastor near the end of the message last week touched on this, and, 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 and a, a verse came to mind. And uh, to be honest, working on the sermon this week, I, I started when I got up for communion to share it last week. And I really feel like the Holy Spirit said, no. But now I understand, because he wanted to wait and share it this week. <laughs> it is one verse that encapsulates that idea. How can we who are struggling now, not yet completely holy and blameless, take confidence in our, our spiritual lives? Listen to what it says in Hebrews 10, 14. I love this verse, especially the way it reads in the New International Version here. For by one sacrifice, he has, past tense, already made perfect forever those who are now in the process continually working at being made holy. He has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. You see, you live in two worlds, really. That's why Heaven and Earth is a good series for us. Because we're living in two worlds. In the heavenly realms, we are already perfect. In the heavenly realms, we are holy, we are righteous, and blameless in His sight. On earth, not so much. <laughs> but that's okay. Because in the process of being made holy here, He has already perfected us in Christ there. Hallelujah. Praise God. He has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. So let's puzzle pieces three and four. Let's look at puzzle piece number uh, one, two, and three. Excuse me. Let, let's say number four. Ephesians 1, 5. Actually, the, the latter part of Ephesians 4 fits in here. In love, he predestined us for adoption, to worship, to sonship, excuse me, through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and his will. He predestined us to adoption. Think about that. That's an amazing thing. You see, before, you know, you know it's popular to say, well, we're all the family of God. Well, in a sense, through creation, that's true. There is a, a brotherhood of man, if you will, because we were all created by God in the image of God. But when it comes to true spiritual reality, we're not. We're not. Before we come to Christ, we're not part of the family of God. In fact, we're part of a different family. Jesus looked at the Jews, and when they were accusing him and attacking him and lying about him, he looked at them, and he said, you're just like your father. You're a liar like he was a liar. In other words, he was saying, you know who your dad is? You know what family you belong to? The devil's your father, and you're part of the kingdom and the family of Satan. Now, now, that's not a very good witnessing tool, let me tell you. You don't want to go to your unsaved friends and say, you know you're the devil's child? You know, you're the bad seed? <laughs> that's not a good way to witness people. But the reality is, before we come to Christ, we're not the family of God. And yet, in what he did for us on the cross, he made us his children. He adopted us as sons of and daughters of God. John 1 12 says this To all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God. And let me make one comment here. This is the NIV. The NIV misses it here because it does say in the Greek to become sons of God. Now, I understand why they put it children because they don't want the ladies to go left out. But there's an important theological distinction here. Because in ancient times, inheritance came through the Son. And when he says you were adopted as a son of God, that means not only are you a child, but you have full rights to all the inheritance. As a child of God, you are literally of the family of God and have full rights to all the inheritance of a son. So you who are not part of the family of God were alienated from God, alienated from the kingdom of God. He has brought you in and adopted you and made you his own. You're his child. He is truly your father. Now, now let me say one thing. This is not one of the pieces of the puzzle, but it goes along with this. In Ephesians chapter 1 verse 6, there's a, another key thing about understanding our subject that's important. And it doesn't quite read uh, 
well as it should uh, in, in, in the NIV, which I'm using for most of this sermon. So let me read to you in the New King James Version. Ephesians 1, 6 says, To the praise, and this is talking about his, our adoption as sons, to the praise of the glory of his grace. So all that's going to end up bringing glory to him because of how gracious and kind and merciful he's been to us, to which he made us accepted in the beloved. Do you know you are accepted in the beloved one? You know, I, I think one of the greatest struggles we all struggle with, it's a, it's a human struggle, is to feel that you are accepted. You just want to know somebody loves you and knows all about you and accepts you just as you are. How many times, you know, I, I, I've heard people say things in, in counseling sessions like, you know, I, I've, I've said something sometimes to people about, you know, I, I know who you are. You're, you're a good friend. They say, no, you don't really know who I am. And I've had people say, no, you don't really want to know who I am. And I think probably all of us, there's secret parts of our heart. Secret areas of our lives, we think, I don't want anybody to know. Because if they knew, I would not be accepted. I would not really be loved by them. God knows you intimately, in great detail. He knows every part of you. He knows every strength, every virtue, every ability. He knows every weakness, every vice, every struggle. He knows all there is to know about you. And through Christ, remember it's all about him again, but in Christ, you are accepted in the beloved one. Right now, this morning, this day, June 13th, 2021, you are accepted just as you are right now. You are accepted in the beloved one. That's what it means to be his child. He accepts you just as you are. Let's look at piece number five of the puzzle. Ephesians 1, 7. In him we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of sins. And of course with the richness of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. The next piece of the puzzle is, is that you are redeemed. You are redeemed. What does that word mean? It means to buy back. To pay a price for. You see, we owed a moral and spiritual debt to God. We were sinful. And we owe to God the price of sin. And what is the price of sin? The wages of sin is death, Romans 6 says. We owed him our life. We owed him our existence. And because we, we could not pay, what that meant was we would spend our existence in hell for eternity. But Jesus comes along and he pays the price for us. He ransoms us. He redeems us. That's what Paul would look at the Corinthians and say, you were bought with a price. He paid for you. He paid for you. He paid the price. And you are now his. You are his possession. Because he paid the price for you. There's an old hymn that says, and I, I love the words of this hymn, Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. And, and, and notice what it says in verse 8 in him doing this. And this is a, a marvelous verse. It says, in this graciousness, in this lovingness, in this redeemingness, he lavished grace on us. He lavished it on us. He gave it to us abundantly. He didn't just give us a little drop of grace and forgiveness and redemption. He lavished it. He did not only what we need, he did more than what we need. He poured it out in abundance on us. There used to be an old preacher in the Church of God some of you may remember him from many years ago, G.W. Lane. And I love to hear G.W. Lane preach. He had a unique style. And I remember one time he was talking specifically about the Baptist and the Holy Spirit. He talked about that verse in John where Jesus said, He that believes in me, I'll have his belly shall flow rivers of living water. And he says, you know the thing is, you come to Christ 
And he said, Lord, I'm thirsty. Give me a drink. He said, okay, here, have a river. <laughs> I love that thought. Not just a cup, not just a drop. Here, you're thirsty. Take a river. Hallelujah. And that's what he did for us in salvation. And when he redeemed us, he gave us abundantly more than we even need. Stop and think about it in just in very practical terms. Isn't it glorious when you come to the house of God and you worship him and you feel his presence? Do you have to have that? Did he have to give that to you? Could not he have, have just said, if you believe me, you'll be saved. And, and you just have to go through life trusting me with no experiences, no blessings, no goodness, no feelings, no sense of my presence until you die. And then you'll have everything, but until then. But no, he lavished redemption on us. I, there, there's so many things in my life that I don't need. They're there by the blessings of God, the goodness of God. Because he has lavished it all upon us. Now, the next portion of the scripture we're going to look at is going to give us the last two pieces of the puzzle. Uh, we're going to skip verses 9 through 12 for a moment. We'll come back to those near the end. Let's skip down to verse 13 and read 13 and 14 and see the, the, the next, pieces 6 and 7. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of our salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance into the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. Now, let me just mention one thing here. You notice here he specifically talking about the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And one of the things I love about this whole portion of Scripture here it is so Trinitarian. It starts off talking about a blessing to the Father. It has many verses talking about the incredible work that the Father did through the Son and the redemption we have in the Son. And then it finishes up by talking about the work of the Holy Spirit. It's a very Trinitarian passage. And it says to us two things here. First of all, piece, puzzle piece number six, you are sealed. You are sealed. Uh, the, the picture here is the picture of something you've probably seen in old movies and television programs. The, uh, a king would have a, a signet ring. And would have the, 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 the coat, his coat of arms or the seal of the kingdom or his initials or something on it that identify as this is the, the ring that belongs to the king. And when he would seal an official document, they would put hot wax on it and he would press the seal into it. And that seal makes it official. And, and what it said oftentimes was he was putting it on saying, this is my seal, this is my contract, or my deal, or my property, or my deed, or whatever. This belongs to me. And so saying that we are sealed means he puts his seal of ownership on us. We are sealed. We are his possession. Now, that, that tells me a couple things. First of all, it says to me, I can't just live any way I want to live. Because I am not my own. I am bought with a price. I belong to somebody else. And my body, soul, and spirit are not mine. They are his. And I can't do with them just whatever I please. I have to do what pleases him because I belong to him. But it also tells me something else. Uh, what is mine... Uh, I'm, I'm very possessive about, you know, it, it's mine. You, you don't, you don't take it away from me, you know. Um, I, I, I love apple pie, and if any of you make really good apple pie, I'm gonna bring it. I'll, I'll take it. But I can tell you what: if I sit down to a dinner at the church today, and you bring me a piece of pie, or Pat bring me a piece of pie, and, and, and Zoe comes over and starts to take it away from me, we're gonna fight. <laughs> That's my pie. That ain't Zoe's pie. That's my pie. You want a piece of pie? You get your own piece. That's my pie. Can I tell you? That's what God does for us. He looks on you. And when the world or the devil or somebody comes against you and starts attacking you and starts oppressing you and starts trying to hurt you, he comes along and says, you take your hands off. 
He's mine. She is my child. She belongs to me. I have sealed her with the Holy Spirit. She belongs to me. I like that. I'm his. And he's going to watch out for me and care for me. It also, though, says a third thing. And that is when we're sealed with the Holy Spirit, Paul says here, that is a guaranteed deposit of things to come. In other words, when he seals you, he says, this is a promise. You belong to me, and salvation is going to be full and complete. The Holy Spirit has given you that down payment, that earnest, if you will, in financial terms, of something very coming. You have a promise of eternal life, of inter eternal inheritance in Christ, and the Holy Spirit is given to us as a deposit, a seal, a down payment, saying it's going to come. I seal it in your life. But, but think again about that signet ring that, that has maybe the king's initial or his coat of arms. It represents who he is. And when he takes it and he presses it into that hot wax, it leaves, it stamps it, and leaves the impression of the image in that wax. So when he seals you, he stamps you with the image of Christ. He stamps his image on you. And in you, it becomes part of your makeup, part of who you are. You've heard me mention before that in the past year or so, uh, one group, I've come to love their music. And, and oftentimes, uh, we, we play this when we get ready to Sunday mornings, it's, it's people in songs. And they have this one song written, when you hear the title, you will think it's an old song, old gospel song. But it's a new song they've written called, There's a New Name Written Down in Glory. And they get to this one part of it where... Paul could tell you what that kind of thing is called, the, the bridge or something or other, I don't know. But anyway, this one guy sings this one line that I absolutely love. It says this, I am who I am because the I am tells me who I am. Isn't that cool? I am who I am because the I am tells me who I am. I am who I am because the I am tells me who I am. I want you to say that with me. I am who I am because the I am tells me who I am. Say it again. I am who I am because the I am tells me who I am. One more time. I am who I am because the I am tells me who I am. You are who you are in Christ because he says who you are. He stamps you. He says this is your identity. This is who you are. You are in Christ. Now, I want to conclude by, by, by look, going back and looking at verses 9 through 12. And the conclusion here is talking about this is all done through the sovereign grace and power of God. Ephesians 1, verses 9 through 12. He did this that he might make known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will in order that we who were the first to put our hope in Christ might be for the praise of his glory. What does that mean? Well, let me put it to you in simple terms. Paul can get very technical, theological, and sometimes you go, I don't know what that means. Okay, let me tell you what it means. God chose to love you from before the foundation of the world. And it was, it, from the beginning, it was his purpose and his plan and his good pleasure and his will to handpick you, redeem you, make you who you are in Christ. He wanted to do it. He wasn't forced to do it. He didn't have to do it. He did it because he chose to do it. And he who can do anything he wants. Now think of it. God can do anything he wants. Of all the possibilities, all the potential realities that could exist, he chose to love you. He chose to choose you. He chose to bless you. 
He chose to redeem you. He chose to make you his own. He chose to redeem, uh, to adopt you. He chose to seal you. He chose to stamp you with his image. He chose all that. He could have done anything, but according to the pleasure of his own will, who can do anything he wants and works out all things according to his sovereign will and according to his power, he chose to bless you. So you can now say, I am blessed with all spiritual blessings in Christ. I was chosen in him before the foundation of the world. I am blameless in the eyes of God. I am adopted by my heavenly father. I am redeemed by the blood of Christ. I am sealed by the Holy Spirit. And I am stamped with the image of Christ. Isn't that something? Wow. I'm going to conclude by telling you a little story. You may have heard this story before. I've heard it used in, in, in numerous uh, lessons and, and sermons through the years for a variety of reasons. I probably wouldn't have thought to use it in this context. But, but it's, it really does fit in here so well. This is a true story. There was a woman named Mary Ann Berg. She was born in, in Brooklyn, New York in August of 1924. She was born with a number of severe uh, abilities and handicaps. For one thing, she had a very severe cleft palate, which later required multiple surgeries. Uh, she struggled with this through her school years, though. Can you imagine a kid? She, she couldn't drink from the drinking fountain. She couldn't blow a balloon. She couldn't do a lot of the other things kids did. Because of this, she was constantly teased by her teammates. They made fun of her. Well, back in those days, some of you may remember things like this happening. Uh, they used to give eye tests and ear tests in school. Teachers did that, you know. And, and in school, Mary Ann was a part of what they would do every year is when he time for those tests, the kids would come up and the teacher would whisper in the student's ear. And if you could repeat back what she whispered, you passed the test. Well, Mary Ann was deaf in one ear. And the teacher didn't always speak to that. And she never knew what the teacher was going to say. And she dreaded to her that was the worst day of the year. Until one year. She got Miss Leonard as her teacher. Came time for the test that dreaded day. And Miss Leonard, one by one, called the students up. Gave the test that this year it would be different. Looking back on that moment years later, Mary Ann Bird said, I waited for those words, words that I now know God must have put in her mouth. Because those are seven words that changed my life. Because men and Miss Leonard leaned across the desk and whispered in Mary Ann's good ear. I wish you were my little girl. I wish you were my little girl. Yeah, I tell you. What? Before, before the foundation of the world, before the creation ever began, before the beginning of time, God has been whispering in every one of us in our ear. I wish you were my child. I wish you were my child. I want you for my own. Think of that. For the, for the, the person who's never known Jesus, he is still whispering in your ear, I wish you were my child. I wish you were my child. And for those of us who know Jesus, his whispering, I want you to know, you're my child. You're my child. Would you pray with me? Father, we are stamped with the image of Christ, who we are. Our identity is only truly known when we find ourselves in you. And God, here in this passage of Ephesians, you 
outline and detail for us the most amazing picture of our identity in Christ. Thank you, Father. Thank you that we are loved, we're blessed, we're chosen, we're adopted, we're redeemed, we're stamped, we're sealed, we're all these things in Christ. God, I pray you would help us to know we are accepted and beloved. Father, help us to know this, not just head knowledge, not just hearing the words that have been spoken today, but Father, in our hearts, in the depths of our spirit, to know this is reality. This is who you are. Uh, excuse me, this is who we are in you. And yes, this is who you are in us. God, help us. God, then we would change our lives if we can fully accept, realize, recognize, understand who we are in Christ. And God, then there is a world out there, people all around us who are so desperate to know who they really are. God, we live in a culture where this is one of the defining characteristics of our culture right now. It's people wanting to find their own identity and they're searching for it in all the wrong places. God, they're seeking for it in dead ends and they're setting up idols and, and they're, they're defining themselves in ways that are uh, uh, totally opposite of who they really are meant to be, God. Would help us to take who we are in Christ into a world that is hurting and lonely and desperately wanting acceptance and desperately wanting to be loved and let them know they can find who they are in Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord, that you have truly equipped us with everything we need to be able to do this. In Christ's name we pray. It's always difficult for me to have to follow Victor. I start to say on Sunday morning, I could just stop that sentence right there, anywhere. Um, but it's especially on Sunday morning. It's generally when he finishes, I just want to go to a corner somewhere and pray for about an hour. And if you want to do that this morning, feel free, find a corner. Um, but I want us to respond today. And, and you can respond in a lot of ways. I, with your connection card today, I, I want to encourage you. This was on last week's card. And I started including it again today, but I'll just mention it again today. So there's not a box, but if you want to write this in, this is a write-in candidate. You want to write this in at the bottom. And, and to, to join the challenge that I gave you last week to let's make... You know my pet peeves with this word, but for lack of a better way to say it, let's make church more than just Sunday. Um, and, and take five minutes every day to read a chapter of Ephesians. There's six chapters. There's six days between now and next Sunday. There's short chapters. They average about 25 verses a chapter. Some less, some a little more, but it, it's the average. It's about 155 verses. So if, if, if you just read every so tomorrow, read Ephesians 1, Tuesday. Those of you that have joined that challenge, I encourage you to continue that. If you, if you didn't get a chance to do that, do that this week and just say five minute challenge. Just write that in the comments so Victor knows to email you and encourage you about doing that this week. But I encourage you that. Also, I, I have a new challenge for you. And it fits kind of in this, uh, you've got there to, to memorize Ephesians 1 3. Um, Victor has really taken it easy on you. That's a super simple verse. <laughs> That next challenge, though, says, I will ask God to help me to understand my true heavenly identity that is found in Christ. And, and so if you check that box, here's what I want you to do this week. If you've got your blanks all filled in, you've, you've got it already written down. But if you haven't, you just want to write them down again. Uh, put, them, put them all up on the screen, Chase, for me. Here's what I want you to do every day. Here's what's going to help you to understand who you are. Every day I want you to get up 
And I want you to say, I am blessed. I am chosen. I am blameless. I'm adopted. I'm redeemed. I'm sealed. And I'm stamped. Start every day that way. Reminding yourself of who the I am says you am. That's not good grammar, but that's... The song uses better grammar, I guess. But, 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 but have that... Have that sort of, uh, maybe this will help us stick have that sort of Popeye moment. I am who I am, what I, what I am, what I am, I can't even, no, I can't even figure out how Popeye says it. I am what I am because the great I am says what, who I am. And then remind yourself of who you are. You're blessed, you're chosen. Oh, I thought I had it memorized. You're blessed, you're chosen, you're blameless, you're adopted, redeemed, Sealed and stamped. And just say that to yourself over again. It's not, about, it's not a positive confession. I mean, it is a positive confession, but it's not about that. You are literally quoting the word of God. And if you do it on one day, you, you have read it in chapter one. But say it. Remind yourself of who you are. We live in, Victor mentioned this uh, briefly, but we live in a culture that is so obsessed with identity. And by trying to give you the choice of identity, they've actually made so many boxes. Sometimes I fill something out. I have so many boxes to check. I don't know. I'm white, Caucasian, non-Hispanic, hetero, cisgender. What I, I don't know how many boxes I had to check. <laughs> and I feel like in an attempt to try to give us choices, I, it's made it almost impossible to identify. You're almost everything. Can I tell you what to make it simple? Can I give it to you simply? You are who he says you are. That's your identity. And if you just simplify it down to that, this. I would even agree that, that whatever you're struggling with or what you're going through, what you're identifying is, is it, you were born that way. You can't help it. Jesus said, though, that you must be born again. So it doesn't matter how you were born. Your identity is in him. Find your identity. Be stamped with the identity he has put on you. That's what matters. It doesn't really matter how you were born. I was born uh, hetero something to crave and lust and desire uh, every woman I see. That's who I was born to be. Some of you are banging it right now. This isn't a letter of resignation. This isn't. <laughs> and so therefore... Uh, no, but because I am not stuck with that identity because I was born again in Christ Jesus and he sees me as blameless and he has washed me in the word, I can choose to identify with him and remain faithful to my spouse, not because I was born that way, because I am his and he has said, this is who you are to be. So respond with, with your connection card this morning with those ways. Respond with your giving. You say, well, what giving got to do with your identity? Well, if you want to know who you are, then you know who your source is. And giving is the greatest way to, to declare in an incredibly practical way of who my source is. I don't give out of obligation. I don't give because this is a club that I have dues in. I give because of a love and a heart expression of, of wanting to give to the kingdom, give to the one, to tithe, I tithe because uh, I, I, I just basically follow a biblical principle that says, God, 10%, it's all yours, but you only ask for 10% back. And then I give above that just to say, I love you and I love what you're doing. I love more than that. And I'm going to give beyond that. Um, this, you are so faithful uh, as a congregation to, to give. And I just, I, first of all, say, as a pastor, I thank you for that. But God honors that. We, we had an opportunity this week, I was at our state camp meeting, which is a gathering of, uh, of, of, of congregations this year. It was limited the first two nights for uh, uh, ministers only because of some restrictions, and then the restrictions got lifted somewhat. They kind of opened it up the last night to anybody who wanted to come, but it's sort of done on Friday morning. It wasn't really a lot of notice to tell everybody. 
But, but we were there to, um, and Bishop, if you see this, I wasn't criticizing your decision. That was a good thing to open that up. Um, but but it, at that meeting, they asked each of us pastors to, to, to bring an offering because they were trying to raise money for missions. And the missions they were raising money for were, were our, our, our brother Cruz is in Venezuela, who we supported. Uh, Wayne and Phyllis Wozniak in Peru and their school in, in Columbia, who we support. Frank Allen over in Portsmouth doing local uh, ministry there in, in, a, in a local missions context, who we support. And so I thought, well, these are all people we support. And, and, and I had, we had, in this past year, we had noticed there was some missions giving that had come in that hadn't been assigned to any particular project and hadn't gone anywhere. I talked to Victor, we were wrestling, what kind of project? Well, when I had this opportunity to go bring an offering, I thought, well, let's just take this as our offering. This is all projects we support. It's money that's come in for Church of God, World Missions. We'll take that. And so last week, I, I, I asked our, our accountant to sort of run through the books. Hey, can you go through, see how much is accumulated, and we can take, and I'll just take that as an offering and we'll do it. Can I tell you, we took a check for $1,000. Because you've been faithfully giving, been following biblical principle. Paul said that. He actually talked about missions giving to one of the churches he wrote. And he said, set aside a little each week. And some of you do that. Some of you give to world missions. And I want you to let you know, it is blessing three incredible pe projects, people, ministries. So I, I continue, I ask you to continue to respond that way. Because if you know whose you are, then you know who your source is, and you know where it comes from, and it makes you a, a generous giver. That's just a fact. And then respond today uh, as, we, as we go to the Lord's table. And I was thinking about communion today. I thought, what better way to talk about who we are in Christ, to identify with who we are in His, that we are adopted, we, we have our, our feet around the table, as it were. And that's what communion is. It is a a common union, it's where we come together in, in a tangible way as we take bread and juice that Jesus identified as his body and his blood on that night before he went with his disciples and he told us to do this. He said, do it and, and as often as you do it, remember me. And, and as we come to the day, table in communion with him today, there's, there's two things I, I want us to realize. That, First of all, we know that this isn't the actual body and blood of Christ. We, we don't believe that theologically. We believe it's symbolic in nature. But it's more than just that. Because the act of communion is more than just the elements of communion. It is a sacred moment where we come in union with him. And we acknowledge that just as real as that, that this wafer, I can stop short of calling it bread, this wafer... Uh, that, that we're sort of, you know, I can't wait till we get back and, uh, to, to, to our normal practice. But when we, we take, we get back to bread. Yes, you said it. I, I couldn't have said it any better. Uh, but when we get back, but, but even this, as, as, it, as, as your taste buds taste it, hopefully if you've had COVID, you've got that back and you can taste it. But as real as it feels, as you swallow it, as you drink it, he is just that real in you. And we are just as connected with him. And we are in union with him. We, our identity is in him. That's what we've been talking about all morning. And so what a great way to, to practically walk that out as we join together, all together, separately, but all together, and we partake of him. And we acknowledge that we are heirs with Christ that we are adopted, that we are all together, we are all one. So I, I want us to do that this morning. Before we do, I just, just ask you whether you're watching this and taking with elements you have at home or whether you're here today and partaking with the elements we've given you here. To search your heart. To search your heart. You know that we don't come in our I had several people I saw, I saw people this week that, that I see maybe once, twice a year at the most, at, at sort of gatherings that we have denominationally and I got asked this question a lot I don't know why they kept asking me this question they'd say have you you been obeying yourself or been behaving yourself I got asked that a lot and I thought why do you keep asking me that and I got to where I just answered no <laughs> not at all 
you know? Um, and, and, and I sort of gave it a, a sort of qualifi qualifier. I said, no, I haven't been in a haven at all. Uh, I, 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 or, so I had a couple that asked me, so you tell the more old school preachers, they would say, are you been living right? You know? And I'd say, no. But I'm in his righteousness, so it's okay. I can't live right. I can't make it on my own. I'm not worthy to partake of this this morning. Not because I'm not. I mean, we have open communion. It's anybody that follows Christ. I, I'm not good enough in and of myself. But I don't partake of this this morning because I'm worthy. I partake of it because I, I know I am in his righteousness. So take a second. We're going to pray in a second. I just ask you to, whether you're here or listening or today or this week, whenever it is, just kind of take a moment and let God search your heart. Let him just do a, a heart search on your hard drive. And just make sure that, that, that you have confessed everything, that everything is good between you and him. That's what righteousness is. It's, a, it's actually a legal term. It means that, that you are right with him. There's no uh, outstanding warrants, as it were, on your heart. And just kind of clean the slate between you and him so that we come into this moment in a worthy manner, not because we're worthy, but because he is most worthy and we are in him. So Father, this morning, we just, we come to you today and I ask you to, to seal our hearts today. We know who you've told us we are. God, I thank you for those of us that have made a confession of faith that we are everything you have said we are. God, I pray for those today that, that maybe are still in their own identity, that they would choose to follow you today to identify with you, to be born again in you so that they might be blessed and chosen and blameless and adopted, redeemed, sealed and stamped. God, I pray for those today that are making that confession right now and saying, God, I know that you came, that you died, that you rose again. I know that here, I believe it. God, in my heart, I choose to follow after you. I choose to believe on you today. Lord, I want to change directions and repent and follow after you and ask you to be the Lord, the owner, the supreme authority in my life. I want to be heirs with Christ and be adopted in this family. Lord, help those of us that have made a confession to remind ourselves who we are to live it out this week. God, I thank you. That, that you, you took uh, bread and, and that cup at the Seder meal that night before you headed to the cross for us, and you said, this is my body, this is my blood. Lord, I thank you for that moment. God, I thank you for the righteousness that we walk in today that allows us to move in full communion with you. We thank you, Father, for this. We praise your name. Lord, we take today the the bread that represents you. your body that was broken for us. And we follow your command today as we take and eat. Thank you for your body today. Take the bread. Lord, I thank you for your blood that was shed for us for the remission of sins for the omission of sins, for the complete cleansing that comes. Lord, I thank you that you died on a cross, that you shed your blood. And today, we choose to join in communion with you as we partake of this juice representing your blood. Take the juice this morning. Father, I ask that as much as these things are in us internally, that you would be with us in a very real way, that your presence would not only be here in this moment, that it would go with us, that it would last with us as the Holy Spirit seals this word on our hearts, as you have stamped your identity of who we are on us today. God, go with us, be with us. Lord, as we finish this time of gathering today, we we pray this benediction from Psalm 1914 together as we live out the identity you have given us. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart 
be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord.